Hello, and welcome once again to Family Historian. My name is Stephen Conti. Tonight we are going to learn about the records of the Dutch Reformed Church. And joining me on tonight's show, I am very honored to have as my guest a young man named Pastor Tom Henyon of the Montville Reformed Church in Montville, Morris County, New Jersey. Pastor Tom is an expert in history, and he also descends from many of the early Dutch families of New Jersey. And on tonight's show, he is going to teach us about the history of his denomination and also how to find our Dutch ancestors. And now let's welcome Thomas J. Henyon Jr. How are you, sir? Welcome to my show. Doing well. Thanks for having me, Stephen. Okay. Pastor, you know, I was reading the outline that you prepared for me, and I said to myself, wow, the Dutch have had such an impact, not only on New York and New Jersey, where they uh, came in the early uh, 1600s, but the entire nation. I mean, we have Dutch people up in Holland, Michigan, where they still have the Tulip uh, Festival. But let's go way back in time to the Dutch Reformed Church and its roots. So if you could tell our viewers about that, where we start with that. Well, if I were going to give you the theological foundations, I'd have to go all the way back to Jesus Christ himself. But we'll fast forward a bit there right. okay. to uh, the Protestant Reformation. Mm -hmm. And the Protestant Reformation uh, began... Uh, most famously with Martin Luther in Germany with the nailing of his 95 Theses, his issues with the church of his day, which was the Roman Catholic Church. Right. Luther had no intention of splitting from the church, only to reform it, to remake it, to see things improved. Hence the Reformation. Correct. Okay. And so Luther then actually is the, the powder keg that sets forth reformations all throughout Europe. And the uh, reformer whom uh, the Dutch Reformed Church can trace its lineage to uh, most directly is John Calvin. Right, now, right. John Calvin was actually a French-born lawyer who in his travels ended up in Geneva, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And it was there that his theology really began to grow, his, his view of the church began to develop, and his idea of the Reformation spread throughout Europe, landing in different places, taking different forms. In Scotland, under John Knox, it became the Presbyterian Church, mm -hmm. but when it landed in the Netherlands, it took a form of its own and became known as the Dutch Reformed Church. The Dutch Reformed Church. Okay. Now. I was following your wonderful outline here. Uh, Holland, or the Netherlands, as we call it. Holland is just a section of the Netherlands, Correct. like a province. There was a king there, uh, King William the Silent of Orange. And there was a lot of conflict between the Netherlands and Spain. The Spanish ruled that area. Is that correct? That's correct. So. The Spanish ruled over the Netherlands and uh, established a Roman Catholic reign. Mm -hmm. And Protestantism began not only as a theological or religious movement, but also very much a political one, mm -hmm. because it, it provided a way of a freedom of breaking from the, the Catholic Spanish rule. Right. And so William of Orange had this wonderful uh, idea of not just creating a, a free a Dutch Reformed Netherlands, but a free Netherlands period for all people to worship and gather. And his vision was actually to unite Catholic and Dutch Reformed and other religious groups together. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a little bit ahead of his time in that regard. Right. It did not quite work that way. And he was ultimately uh, assassinated uh, with lead soaked, uh, poison soaked lead bullets. Really? But he did establish the Dutch Reformed Church as we know it today. His, his movement uh, unified the Netherlands mm -hmm. and, and allowed for the church to become the state church of the Netherlands. Right. And his coat of arms is your symbol. Yes, to this very day, the Reformed Church in America, as we're presently called, still has 
uh, William the Silent of Orange's coat of arms as our uh, denominational symbol. It's on our letterheads. It's it's uh, very prominent, and uh, it, it's a wonderful reminder of this uh, amazing man who unified not only the Netherlands politically but also religiously, right. and uh, really opened the path for uh, much of what was to come. Now, shortly afterward, uh, the Netherlands was a world power at one time. Uh, it's hard to believe uh, today because it's such a peaceful, quiet, mind its own business nation. I lived in the Netherlands in the early 70s, and I loved it very much, hmm. as I still do. But you had the golden age of the Netherlands, and you gave me the years 1565 to 1611. And that brings us to North America and to a famous English explorer who was hired by the Dutch. And who was that? That was Henry Hudson. Yes, you're correct. In those days, it was not uncommon at all for explorers of other countries to sail under whichever flag would pay them to mm -hmm. sail. And so Henry Hudson uh, and uh, on his craft, the Half Moon, sailed up the Hudson, uh, explored uh, all of the Hudson River Valley, uh, paving the way for a Dutch settlement. Right. Uh, new, new Amsterdam. N or New Netherland, the yes. whole area. And um, this was under the Dutch East India Company, which I believe was founded in 1602. Yes. So it was a huge company, and he worked for them. That's correct. I see. And they call him Hen Henrik Hudson, I yeah. believe, or Hendrik Hudson. Yes. Right, okay. And we do have some uh, pictures of the very tip of southern Manhattan where Wall Street is today. And it's hard to believe that the World Trade Center hmm. stands there, the new one, and yes. the old one was there as well. And they built a fort, the Dutch built a fort and a wall, is that correct? That's correct. Hence Wall yes. Street. And if you look at this picture very carefully, uh, you will see some dwellings, you will see the wall and you will see a windmill, which is indicative of the Dutch. It must have been gorgeous in those days, the Absolutely. early Manhattan. Absolutely, and Stephen, as uh, you may recall, the island of Manhattan was purchased from uh, the Lenape Indian tribe, right. also known as the Delaware Indians, for what we might consider to be just a few small trinkets and some, some precious stones, but actually some of these trinkets wound up to be uh, quite advanced farm technology. Right. And so the, the Native Americans there thought they were getting a pretty good deal agriculturally, uh, some, some wonderful technology they would not have had right. access to otherwise. And back then, I was given a figure. They bought Manhattan for $24. And yeah. that, was, uh, that was Peter Minuet. Yes. Okay, and we do have another picture of uh, Peter Minuet. I believe he was of Belgian descent, Belgian French. Yes. And uh, uh, negotiating with the native peoples there. And I, I did read that Manhattan comes from the word uh, Manahata, which means the land of uh, bows, like a bow and arrow. That's where they would get their, their bows. Yes. Isn't that something? So uh, the Dutch established a fort there and was the first church in that fort, the first Dutch Reformed church. Yes, and uh, it was even creatively named the church in the fort. Right. Uh, and so when the church was first founded as part of the commission of the uh, Dutch East India Company, mm -hmm. uh, those early settlers uh, needed religious care. Yes. And so before ministers were actually sent to the Netherlands, uh, there were lay people sent, and mm -hmm. they, they were known as the comforters of the sick. Right, right. And these were just laymen with some religious training. There were two originally sent, and mm -hmm. they went to the church in the fort. And they, they were not allowed to do a whole lot. They could read the liturgy. They could le read anything that was prepared by right. the mother church back in the Netherlands for mm -hmm, them. Mm -hmm. They could not uh, oversee marriages or the sacraments or any of those church rites. But even early on, they knew it was important to have some kind of a presence 
for the people there to help them in this in this new world, in this new established place. Right, that and I believe that, that that first church was built in the 1620s. Yes. I have a date here, 1628. Yes. And it no longer is there. I, I don't know what is there now uh, where that church while, stood. While that building is no longer there, there is still a uh, reformed congregation in New York City that can trace its lineage all the way back really? to the church and the fort. And I'm sure there are descendants yes. from that early, those early Dutch people. Very. Yes. Now, I did mention that you are of Dutch descent. What is the surname or surnames in your family? The, the two uh, Dutch surnames uh, are Dijkstra mm -hmm. and Buen, but Dijkstra is the real good yes. Dutch name. I think it comes from, from the dikes they built yes. in Holland, you know. You know, uh, the Dutch amaze me, and there is a saying that the Dutch uh, always had. It's kind of chauvinistic. They always said the, that God built the world, but the Dutch built Holland. And I, I believe that because I lived in the Netherlands in the early 70s and they love to fight the sea mm -hmm. because it's a very low-lying uh, nation and they build dikes there. And I think when we had our floods, those horrible floods in New Orleans, they called in some Dutch engineers who taught the Americans how to build dikes yeah. to protect them from the sea. And... Uh, in your ancestors' uh, uh, country, which is the Netherlands, the North Sea is a constant threat yes. to them. Okay, very good. And then we have, who was Peter Stuyvesant? I have Peter Stuyvesant here. Was he one of the governors of, of New Amsterdam? Yes, uh, Peter Stuyvesant was uh, w one of the most famous governors of New Amsterdam, really saw the, the establishment and the expansion of the settlement. Uh, I remember one wonderful anecdote uh, about a reformed church pastor who was sent over from the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. See, in those days, all of the theological training still happened right. in the Netherlands. Right, right. And uh, there was one account of, of a young minister who got a call and was excited to get a call, but he, he didn't do his research and didn't realize that the mm -hmm. call was over the Atlantic mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. in this new colony of New Amsterdam. And so he and his family came over and they were serving a church in Long Island. And they were there for years and he received a, a parsonage, but he ends up writing a letter to Peter Stuyvesant Stuyves and mm -hmm. says, uh, very grateful for everything that's happening, but we need floorboards mm -hmm. in our house because we're still sleeping on the dirt floor. And right. we actually have the records in which Stuyvesant writes back, oh, I'll get right on it. We have to make sure the congregation yes. takes care of you. But he, he was a very hands-on practical leader that really saw to the expansion and care of that early settlement. Now, the next year that we have is not too good for the Dutch. 1664 for New Amsterdam or New Netherland. What happened in 1664? In 1664, we see uh, New New Netherlands and New Amsterdam uh, uh, change hands from Dutch control to the control of the English. Uh, it was a non-violent transition. The Dutch realized they were outmanned and outgunned, and so they turned over uh, New Amsterdam uh, to control of the British. But they, they made a deal in which the Dutch could still live mm -hmm. and farm mm -hmm. the land. They, yes. they settled into many parts of northern and central New Jersey. Right, right. And, uh, but it was a, 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 a changing of the rule, and so New Amsterdam uh, would no longer be called New Amsterdam, but became the name that we know it uh, as today of New York. New York, New York. Okay, the Big Apple or Gotham or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> New York, New York. So that was in 1664, that peaceful transition. And I think many uh, early families of New Jersey you will meet people who are of Dutch and English. They did yes. intermarry. If you go into an old cemetery like yours in Montville, you will see both English and Dutch names. When you see the van, like Van Dyne or right. Van Horn or Van Riper, that's a Dutch name, yes. you see. And many of those people intermarried with English settlers. Am I right on that? That's correct. Uh and my wife, uh, on her on her mother's side, mm -hmm. 
uh, they, they've done some uh, tracing and they thought they were English all the way back uh, to the earliest uh, right. settlers. But there's actually some Dutch in there as well to prove your point that the Dutch and the yes. English did intermarry yes. in those early days. Now America. I did mention, uh, you did mention that when the English took over New Amsterdam or New Netherland, many of the Dutch crossed the Hudson into what is now New Jersey up and down the Hudson River Valley, yes. and you can find lots of Dutch people in Bergen County, Passaic County, where you come from, yes. Essex County, and Morris County, where your church is. And we have uh, some pictures of the early Dutch churches. They were wooden, and they were octagonal in shape. Uh, we have one from Fairfield, which is my town in Essex County, New Jersey, and there's one in Totowa, which is in Passaic County. These were the early Dutch uh, churches. Um, and then I do have a, a, a picture here of the Fairfield Reformed Church, which was founded in 1720. You saw the earlier wooden church, but the newer church was built in 1804, I believe. That's right down the road from where I live. It's a, a lovely uh, lovely stone building, very handsome church. Mm -hmm. Now we also have a photo of the Montville Reformed Church and when was your congregation founded, uh, Pastor? Our congregation was founded in 1756. So you're a bit younger than the Fairfield one, we're 1720. Yes. Uh, unfortunately the original building burned down, is that correct, along with the records? Many of the, the records, yes. Uh, so, in fact, the, the original building was located in what is now uh, Booton, uh, New Jersey. Right. And, and the Dutch, being very pragmatic and practical people, whenever mm -hmm. the farmland shifted, whenever settlement shifted, they literally, uh, in our records, they packed up the church building numerous times and would just move it by wagon to the next location. Right. Very and practical. Yes. yes. Okay. Waste not, want not. <laughs> now, getting back to the history of the uh, Reformed Church, 1764 in our country here, uh, it was given a new name, and you told me what that, it, it's a long kind of name, the Reformed uh, Protestant? The Re Reformed Protestant Dutch Church. All right, so that was the, the name that it was given, the official name. Yes. And then we skip ahead to 1867, which is another milestone in your church. What was it called at that time? At that time, uh, it switched from being the Reformed Protestant Dutch Church to the Reformed Church in America. Right, the RCA. Yes. Okay, not Roman Catholic, Reformed Church in America. Correct. Okay. And this is very good because your denomination you don't have to be of Dutch descent, and this is why they changed it, I believe. Yes. Uh, people of all nationalities belong to your church. Yes. And uh, in fact, in, in many ways, the, the history of the uh, RCA, the Reformed Church in America, or the Dutch Reformed Church, uh, is very much the history uh, of America, of these Dutch immigrants coming right. and, and finding the, the balance, striking the balance, mm -hmm. having conflicts between holding on to their, their Dutch heritage right. and culture and becoming uh, American. And, right. and many of the conflicts uh, in the church throughout history and mm -hmm. in the Reformed Church reflect that of, do we stay part of the church in the Netherlands or mm -hmm. do we do our own thing? When the revolution happened, you have mm -hmm. the Dutch Reformed Church being very split between supporting right. the Tories or supporting mm -hmm. the revolution itself. So now they embrace all people. Yes. I mean, you have German people coming to your church, Italian, African American. It's yes. an all embracing denomination. If you want to learn about the history of the uh, Reformed Church in America, there is a book. I think this is required reading. Yes. All right. It's called By Grace Alone, and this is what all you ministers have to read uh, cover to cover. All right, now let's get to the how-to of the genealogy part. Yes. The Domini, what does Domini mean, the Domini, in the, in the uh, Dutch church? What does that word mean? 
So Domini actually comes from the Latin dominus, which means power or authority, mm -hmm, and it's mm -hmm. the term that is used for ministers in the Dutch Reformed Church. Okay, fine. Now the first, the best part, the best place to start your research is to go right to the church, is that correct? Yes, many of our churches have uh, very extensive records uh, going back quite a ways. And uh, the dominie, the, the minister, along with the clerk of the church, mm -hmm. would keep those records. Right, and we do have uh, some pictures of original Dutch Reformed records going back into the early 1700s. We're going to hold them up to you right now to see what you're in for when you do this kind of uh, work. It's very fancy calligraphy. It's all in Dutch. And we have a baptism record. I think it's from the year 1715. Uh, we have a, uh, a marriage record and a burial record. And these are from various Reformed churches. Um, now, when you go to a Dutch Reformed church that maybe no longer exists or uh, has closed for some reason, I know that you people do have an archive. All of the denominations will have an archive. Yes. Where is your archive? So our archive is the Gardner Stage Library and it's located on the campus of New Brunswick Theological Seminary, which is actually located on the campus of Rutgers University. Right. And I have been there, I've done research there myself, and you have been there yes. doing some kind of research. And we're going to hold up the, uh, the address and telephone number of the Gardner Sage Library where the archive of the Reformed Church in America archives are housed. Correct. And they have an archivist there who will help you. And these are records from all over the, the United States, I believe. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Another source would be the Mormons. Uh, they have been microfilming records for years. Just look under familysearch.org, okay? I'm turning you into a, a genealogist, okay? Even though you're a very fine historian. <laughs> um, and I also discovered the Holland Society of New York. Have you heard of them? I have. All right. And they have very early Dutch Bibles. People of Dutch origin have donated their family Bibles to them. And that's a wonderful, wonderful source. Um, do you have any other sources that you can think of that are uh, very popular in the Reformed Church that people can use? Uh, th those are, are the best ones. And also, if you do know of a local church uh, that's, that your family had a history with, reach out to them, and they can always point you in the right direction if they don't have the records themselves. Right. Now, unfortunately, your early records were destroyed. Is that correct? Or they, our, they are in the archive? or Our earliest records, but we, we still have uh, pretty decent records from the uh, mid-19th century on hit or miss, uh, mm -hmm. depending. Uh, we're also currently building, uh, we have a, a very old and extensive uh, cemetery, and we've actually been doing the work of uh, documenting all of the, the names and birth and death dates of everyone in our cemetery. And our cemetery is quite old. I yes. encourage anybody who has some time on their hands to come down. We have revolutionary uh, era graves. Uh, in, the, in the cemetery across from the church, but we're working to archive all of those names and dates um, into a database that will be open to everyone once we finish that work as right. well. And I've taken many, many walks in that cemetery. Um, you have to visit the church in Montville. It's a very lovely country church. It is. Your church right there. And there is a museum piece in the sanctuary. You showed me this well, tell our viewers what that is. I mean, this goes way, way back, so, and it's in a glass case. Yes, we, we have a, a family of the church uh, was very generous in donating uh, their family Bible, which dates back to the early 1700s. Mm -hmm. That Bible is prominently featured in the back of the church under glass protection, and uh, it's all in Dutch, a beautiful handwritten uh, calligraphy and, and many of the, the chapters, and mm -hmm. uh, it's just a wonderful piece of history that I admire every time I go in to the sanctuary. Are many of the early Dutch descendants uh, uh, still in your church that come to your church? 
There, there's a, early families. A good bit, a good bit, and those that are no longer in the church are still in the area, and mm -hmm. uh, will will come by from time to time, and it's kind of like a homecoming, right, uh, right, of coming back to a place filled with their family history. And they all all, all their last names begin with Van, I'm sure, or <laughs> Van or Stra. So, so the Dutch, going back to what we were talking about before, Stephen, the Dutch are very pragmatic and practical people, mm -hmm. and so the last the surnames often reflect either where a person was from or what they did. Right. So in the case of my family surname Dykstra, as we mentioned before, mm -hmm. the Stra just means of the. Right. So they're the people of the dyke. I see. Or the Van or Vander means of the or from the. Right. So it's just a ref very practical way to name you of where you were from, uh, what your family did, or, or where they were located back in the Netherlands. Right. I know the name Van Ness is a very popular name yes. in my town and your town uh, in Montville. Uh, van der Hof, yeah. of the judge, the, the Hof. Do you speak any Dutch? Or do you Not have, enough. You know, you know a few words. <laughs> uh, my, my Dutch is very poor. My grandmother uh, tried to teach me a good bit of Dutch, and uh, I lost it to uh, Greek and Hebrew and Spanish over the years. Right, uh, right. But no, uh, it's, it's a wonderful language. There are a few people in our congregation who still have a pretty good handle on Dutch. I'm glad that Dutch heritage and culture is still alive and well. Yes. Right here in New Jersey, right here in New Jersey. Well, this has been a wonderful interview with Pastor Thomas J. Henyon. Did I say that correctly? You did. Okay, Junior, okay, who was the minister at the Montville Reformed Church in Montville, Morris County, New Jersey, a beautiful country church. Thank you so much, young man. It's great to have you back and have you here. And uh, on that note, as I've been saying for many, many years, we are all descendants of ancient civilizations. Genealogy is your key to the history of your family. And so until next time, this is Stephen Conti wishing you the very best of luck in your research and above all, happy ancestor hunting. Good night.